real pleasure to be here before you today. We've got a great crowd. Um, these gentlemen in the front have been singing bass and tenor. You guys are awesome. It's that was really good to have that accompaniment there. Um, very, very thankful to be here, and I'm glad that you're all here as well. Um, we've been studying the Old Testament for a while. Um, my wife has been at a at a town here taking care of my aunt for the last week, so when I dressed this morning, I put on my work clothes instead of my, my church clothes, so uh, please don't hold that against me. Um, we are in Exodus, as you can see up there, chapter 14. Israel has had a really tough time in their life for the last 430 years. They've been stuck in, in Egypt as slaves, building bricks, watching their babies being murdered, and doing all the things that um, they wish that they didn't have to do. And God finally heard their, their prayer, and He intervened, and He brought them out of Egypt. And as we go through this study, um, it's really interesting to see some of the things that God uh, will tell these people and the way that he will interact even at this early date with them and help them to uh, obtain their freedom, a freedom from slavery, and become the kind of people that God has wanted his, his people to be from the very beginning. So starting in verse Exodus 14, verse 10, it says, As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord. So here's the stage. Pharaoh and his army, with all of the chariots lined up with spears at attention, their battle uh, gear just shining in the sun. Horns are blowing. Swords and spears are raised. These horses that are pulling their chariots are chomping at the bit. And men are shouting, these soldiers are shouting in excitement. But down at the end of the holler, steep sides of the mountains on either side, the Red Sea at their back, nothing but staffs in their hands and perhaps eating knives on their belts. <clears throat> The Israelites are shaking in their sandals, but feared for their very lives. And why shouldn't they be afraid? These are the same people who have abused them for the last 430 years. Even though they do not yet know their God all that well, if they would but look behind them, they would see the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire of the Lord is there to rescue them, and maybe even he has, oh, I'm at a, at two maybe he even has his own chariots, as it says in Psalm 68, verse 17, with mighty chariotry, twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands, the Lord came from Sinai into the holy place. But unfortunately, these folks well, they're so taken up with their fear, they're unable to see it for what it really is. The glory and the might of the Lord is right there before them if they would just look and if they would just see. So where is their faith placed? Is it in what they have been through for the last 400 and some years? Or what they have seen the Lord already do for them. They've already just gone through the ten plagues and watched the glory and the, and the power of the Lord rescue them from these people. Do they even remember those ten plagues? Just look at some of what God has done. How could they not remember what they have just gone through just a short time before this? <clears throat> what about all of the plunder. They're carrying gold and silver and fine clothes from the people of, of, of Egypt. And most importantly, what about the pillars? 
that are of cloud and fire right there before them. In Psalms 105, the cloud not only led them, but also shaded them from the heat of the day. The fire brought them comfort in the light of darkness, of the unknown that they had just passed through. Why are they not seeing all of these things now? This is a battle they do not have to fight, and yet they are all ready to give up. Such little faith just days after amazing miracles. It is really hard to comprehend. After several weeks of their own newfound freedom, Israel has made it to the Red Sea. But is this a path of freedom? Or maybe a trap with nowhere to go? Is it a lot of people that are going to die? And will what remains be brought back to Egypt as slaves? And then they would have to go through the whole thing of having their babies murdered once again. Israel has their backs against the sea with mountains on either side and Pharaoh and his army coming toward them to annihilate them. Folks, if you just think about the situation that they're in, just for a minute, it's really not hard or difficult to feel the fear that these people would be feeling considering their circumstances. It's not hard to understand how they would still be looking to the physical, what they see right before their eyes. And that's just a bunch of angry men in battle guard with brandishing spears and swords. If you look at Pharaoh's perspective, it's not hard to imagine him believing he had them right where he wanted them. And it would be easy pickings and rounding them up and putting them in chains and then hauling them back to Egypt as slaves once, a, once again. In his mind, he might be viewing himself at the head of a great parade, coming into Egypt with glory of victory shining in his eyes as his slaves are marched before them, and him and the people in chains. It's a very unfortunate that they, not, that they are only looking at what is right before, right before their eyes, rather than all the great things which was demonstrated to them over and over again in the last year or so. But they still have not, they still have a lot to learn and a bunch of growing up to do. And so with that in mind, look what happens next. In Exodus 14, verse 11, it says, And they said to Moses, Why do you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't, we, weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? He said, We said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. When we look at the scene that unfolds for the people of Israel, it's difficult to understand how quickly they change their demeanor and their, of their situation. They start out right when they cry out to the Lord back there in verse 10. Yet, they allow their fear to gain a foothold in their hearts and they see what they are up against, forgetting what God has done up to this point, and is in fact the one who has been doing the fighting for them from the very beginning. And so they start a very dangerous and a damaging way of living their lives and dealing with the way God does things. And this really starts with confronting Moses and blaming him for their perceived problems. What's sad is that they really is what's sad is that we will hear this complaint over and over again as we go through the Old Testament. And anytime things get difficult for them, they take the same sort of attitude. I think that is the same for us in our own lives from time to time. It's that same same old complaint. God, why me? 
I gave my life to you, but now, but now I have to deal with this. You can fill in your own blanks here. I think the difficulty comes from believing that our following God will be easy. We're never told that, we'll, that it will be easy when we give our lives to God. We sure wish that it would. Everybody wants to be have a good, clean life, no problems. Folks, that ain't the way the world is. We live in a fallen world. However, even though we are confronted with difficult situations, we are to give thanks, even when the time gets tough in our lives. That's a hard thing to do. If you are feeling down, the Bible says just give thanks. You don't have to give thanks for the problems that you're having, but there's a ton of stuff that you can give thanks for every single day. All of those little things. I mentioned last time, one of the things we're thankful for in the winter time is just our, we have a, a heated blanket that covers our mattress. And when it's cold outside, you turn that thing on for an hour beforehand, and it, you just groan in pleasure of how well that thing, just the little things in life to give thanks for is what God says to do. If you are one of those people who always seem to feel down for one reason or another, you might have you might consider you have fallen into the same pitfall as these Israelite people. They have seen what God is capable of, and yet at every bump in the road they gripe and they complain. We tend to take for granted every blessing we have in our lives, and we have it in such abundance. The problem comes in when the Israelite people forget or perhaps they just ignore what has taken place over the last years as God fought for their freedom, winning every single round against Pharaoh and his gods. How is it that they should so quickly forget so unforgettable and astounding events? Think about this just for a minute. How easy would it be for anyone to have faith when God displays his power in such a way right before their eyes. These people had more evidence of God's power to have faith than anyone before them or almost anyone since. Yet they seem to have little faith at this time. It's really, it's really sometimes just a difficult thing to understand. But remember, these are... These are children in the way of God at this point. Faith is not some kind of vague hope grounded in one's imagination, what we call wishful thinking. What faith really is, it's a confidence <clears throat> that something that is in the future that has not yet been seen, but still this thing is promised by God is going to come true because God said that it would. This type of faith is a biblical faith and it's not a blind trust. <clears throat> Regardless of the evidence, but a trust in the one true God of the universe who is infinitely powerful knowing and wise beyond even our all of our understanding that we could ever come up with. These people are one step above this type of faith because they have the promises that they and they have the evidence of the one true God power. They saw it for them very south. They saw when all those locusts and all those flies and all of those other things that attack them, the hail and the darkness of light, blood, all of those things, they saw that with their very own eyes. And some of them, at the very beginning, was even abused by some of those things. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. 
By faith we understand that the words were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Brothers and sisters, the, the same God who is all-powerful, infinitely wise, and eternally trustworthy, the creator of the worlds of the universe, this is the same God who has revealed himself to us, not only in his creation, but in his word. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ and gave us promises that have proven true from generation to generation from the very beginning and who will never leave or forsake those who he calls his own. Hebrews 13.5 This is the type of faith that we have in those unseen promises of God. That is what Paul is trying to teach us in chapters 11. These promises are what help us have the confidence and assurance to all who receive Christ as their Lord and their Savior. As we continue on in our story in verse 14 and 13, But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you, and you must be quiet. <clears throat> now, lacking the faith that God has already been trying to still in these people with their backs up against the Red Sea, who have seen miracles upon, upon miracles, and in fact the miracles of the pillars of cloud and fire are still right there before them, they cry out in a manner of blame rather than help. And how sad is that? And so Moses comes forward and he reprimands them and encourages them to get their fear under control and to stand strong before their enemies. For God will once again bring them to salvation. And not only will God deliver you, you will never again have a problem with these Egyptian slavers. Why? Because the Lord is going to fight for you once again. He wants to teach them to trust Him before He leads them into the promised lands. He's conditioning these people. As the events begin to unfold, Moses gives them a pep talk. He lets them know that not only is God going to continue their salvation from these putter-downers, after God rescues them once again, but they will never see them, these men, ever again in their lives. And now, if you stop and just think about that just for a minute, that statement really has a finality to it. The reason they will never see them again is that they're going to be dead. So to be so, Moses says, be quiet and let God once again do his thing. In verse 15 it goes on and it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And so Moses speak, uh, So God speaks to Moses once again and directs the next course of the action, which might come as somewhat of a shock to these people because he says, tell the Israelites to go forward. Go forward? <laughs> You want us to walk into the sea? That's what's in front of us. We have to walk into the sea? What kind of salvation is that? God says, yes. That is exactly what I want you to do. And to demonstrate my power and glory you once again, uh, for you once again, so that you can take courage. I'm going to send 
use some more help. In 19, the angel of God who is going before the Israelites' army moved and went behind them, and the uh, pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. It's very important for us to understand once again why these events are going to unfold as they are. Even though every one of the plagues have shown both Egyptian and, and the Israelites that all honor belongs to the Lord and not to Pharaoh, the victory over Pharaoh's chariots in the Red Sea will increase the Lord's status in Egypt and all of the surrounding nations. But I believe more importantly, it will show Israel God's power and their need and reliance on the one and true God. They could never, ever do better. Once again, God is conditioning them and helping them to have the faith that they will need in the years to come. 1920, or, uh, 19 and 20 are further indication that God is going to protect them and moves an impassable barrier between the two people so that they can pass safely to the other shore. You would think this would be another indication to the Egyptian army that they are once again completely out of their league. All of a sudden this cloud comes from behind them and they puts this impassable barrier between these two people. What are you going to think about that? For crying out loud, these people, what do they got in their mind? Folks, the pillar of cloud and fire was a miracle. And, and it was an impassable mir uh, uh, thing for the Egyptian people to be able to go through. It was also a sign of the blessed care of their Lord God. God was the deliverer while they were captives. He was their guide, their protector, and their provider while they were pilgrims. There have been many different cultures around the world who use fire and smoke as signals in their marches, but here God himself was showing himself as their leader and their general. These pillars of cloud and fire were a guide, they were a gift, and they were a glory. There are a few things to consider about these pillars of the Lord. As a guide, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud were the guides of this rescued nation of Israel. As long as they could see this cloud hovering over them, protecting them from the fierce rays of the sun while they're in the desert, they knew they were led toward where they needed to go. Pretty hard to lose your way following a big old honking cloud that's, that's floating in the sky. But the cloud also sheltered them from that brunt, full brunt of that desert heat. The pillar was visible sign of the Lord's presence in Israel ever before them, day and night. What a tremendous gift God was giving them as they moved on towards the promise that he had given to them. Now notice something similar to us. James 1 and 16 says, Do not be seen, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be, kind, be a kind of first fruits, of his creatures. James reminds us of God's goodness. In our trials, God is not tempting us to sin, but the difficulties in life are used to strengthen and perfect us and make us more like God. God's intention for us are always for the good. There's nothing in this world that is truly good that has any other origin than what is from above and is descending from the Father of lights into our lives. God never changes who he is 
and so in his giving of good never changes even though there are the changes of the night and the day and the changes of the shadows because of the sun and the moon and the stars. Notice also that the pillar of clouds and fire are also used as a guard between the people of Israel and the army of the Pharaoh. Talk about a guard. No matter which way that army tried to move around this barrier, if in fact they were foolish enough to do so, the pillars were always there to keep them from going against the, pe the people. If you get something, if you get time sometime, do a search of God and clouds. If you do any study of this at all, eventually, eventually you will come across the word of Shekinah. This pillar of cloud and fire is known as the Shekinah glory. The first time we are introduced with clouds is they are associated with a covenant. Genesis 9, God made a covenant with Noah and all of his offspring as well as all living creatures of the earth to never again destroy the earth with a flood. God provided a rainbow in the clouds as a sign of this covenant so that all the flesh of the earth might remember his promise and not fret every time it begins to rain. Here in Exodus, the cloud is the Shekinah glory, the visible manifestation of the Lord leading his chosen people of Israel out of slavery and out of sin of the world and lead them into the land of the promise to give them for their inheritance. In other words, this second occurrence of clouds also has a very specific reference to a covenant, just as the clouds did with Noah and the flood. The ones that might interest you more is the ones concerning Jesus, which has to do with a new covenant given to all of the peoples of the earth. When Jesus' time is approaching the time of the cross, Moses and Elijah appear with him when he is upon a mountain. The apostles being overcome with wonder, Peter wants to make three-tenths of honor for these great men. But in Matthew 7 and verse 5, it says, He was still speaking when, behold, a bright light overshadowed them. And a voice from the clouds say, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is exactly what is meant by the Shekinah glory of the Lord. Then after Jesus has risen, and again when Jesus returned, two more examples of Shekinah glory. Acts 1 and verse 9, it says, When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Again in Revelation 1 and 5 and 7. To him who loves all and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even, though, even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so... Amen. The pillars was intended to show God's glory to Israel and to Egypt for two different reasons. To Israel, it was where it was there to encourage them and to show what amazing power and glory they have backing them. It was the kind of awe-inspiring sight <clears throat> that would still in them hope and would give them courage. For the Egyptians, it was to show what amazing power and glory they have in opposition to them. When they saw those pillars blocking them from going forward, how could they be so blind to what was really, what was really happening? I really believe the soldiers were just being good soldiers and were commanded to go forward regardless of what they were feeling. Folks, that's what, that's what good soldiers do. That was what they were trained to do. 
the arrogance of the commanders to make them go forward regardless of what they have already been through is really just kind of disheartening. It's really a sad deal. God provides the guidance of the path and the lives of his people. The Israelites are free from Egypt, but they need a path to follow. And God provides the path. And notice from the map, that is not the easiest path, but the one that leads them to salvation. They could go, they could go up at the very top of your the map there to the right and get into the promised land. That's where the promised land is. But God leads them through the desert and a long way away from that towards a thing called Mount Sinai where he will give them the law. <clears throat> if they continue to follow God and not get on the wrong path of fear, they will make it. This will be proved out when they're confronted with the massive walls of water on the right and left sides as begin their miles-long journey through the Red Sea. If you've ever watched um, the movie The Ten Commandments with, with Charlton Heston, uh, Yul Brenner as Pharaoh, they did a very good job of creating those walls of water. That's what they were saying. But what was even more amazing than just those walls is when you walk into something that had a lot of water and you expect to meet a bunch of mud, and they didn't have any of that. They walked across that Red Sea as if it was a paved avenue. So this would be proved out when they are confronted with those massive walls of water on their right and left. They had to have take that had have that had to have taken a tremendous amount of courage to begin that long walk. That must have been an awe-inspiring sight, just a hundred feet of water, right there both on their left and their right side. And to further astound them, they get to do it on dry ground. And so how amazing is that? Another miracle right before their eyes. But not only does God tell them the right way to go, He leads them in the right way to go. Verse 31 tells us that God went ahead of the people and a pillar of cloud, and led them during the day, and a pillar of fire that he led them in the night. And again, another awe and tremendous sight that they had right before them. Through Moses, God delivered his people. The people saw and experienced all of the miracles. There could be no doubt who provided deliverance for the people. I can't even imagine how the people must have felt as they experienced the joy of freedom. However, when we were baptized into Christ, we too were released from a bondage, the bondage of the brutalness of sin. So in some ways, I think those who have been baptized into Christ can understand how freedom really feels. Wouldn't it be nice today if we could take out our iPhones or whatever phone you use and pull up an app and be able to call upon a, a map app showing us our route through life as God would direct. God does provide a path for us to follow today. We just have to be open and humble enough to look for the cloud right in our life to follow. Now, something we should consider, many times a journey through the wilderness is viewed as wandering in the wilderness. This is really not the case at all. It's important to understand that these folks were not wandering around. God was leading them on the path that they should go. Just look at the pillars. Looking at the map, there was a quicker route from Egypt to Canaan, but God led his people towards the desert and of Sinai. First, to teach them some important lessons and then to give them the law that they could live by and that they would prosper all of the rest of their days. One of the things we need to be aware of is that God has a path for us as well. And just like Israel, it's not always an easy path. 
or even a direct one. Sometimes the path God lights up for us to take will look crazy to us as well as to those that are around us. However, God has a reason for the path he sets before us. For the Israelites, God had a path. <clears throat> God had a plan for the path that he was leading them. One part of that plan was to once again prove to the Egyptians who the true God was, but also to bring home to Israel the same, exact same thing, with the added benefit of making sure that they knew who their God was. Sometimes it might seem like we are going in the wrong direction when God is striving to teach us something for the future. Regardless, whatever path you are on in your life, ask yourself, what is God trying to teach me on the path? How am I coping with it? And I am, am I open to the change that's before me? If it seems to be a really difficult one, am I looking to see what God is trying to teach me? Am I just focusing on how difficult it is? That's an easy thing to do. If the path that I'm on is an easy one, again, Am I looking to learn what God is trying to teach me? Or maybe I'm just cruising along. Now I'm here to tell you when times get tough, it's not always easy to consider the things with an open mind right away. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to sort through your feelings with prayer and deep thinking. Keep your eyes focused on those pillars and it will guide you through if you keep an open and a humble heart. We don't want to close the lesson without offering the invitation. I'm grateful for your patient and attention here this morning. The Bible teaches us that there's a path that people can take to find God. We call it the plan of salvation. Here, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will put on Christ, is what Galatians tells us. If there's someone that has other needs, if you um, become a Christian and there's something in your life that you would like to share with the church or uh, have other uh, have the church pray for you, we also give you that opportunity here at this time. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, please get with someone else um, after the services. Call on anyone here. We'd be glad to help you in any way that we possibly can. So please come forward as we stand and sing the selected song.